good morning. You know, I was just uh, listening back there, and I mean, all the services, I, it's been interesting. You know how he comes out and says, hey, all of you married couples, and you know, are you out there, and then like nothing happens. You notice that? And then he's like, oh, come on, married couples, and then there's a little bit of shouting going on. You know what I believe that is? I have gotten in some of the worst fights I've ever gotten in with my wife on the way to church. <laughs> That's why when you ask that question, some of you on your way to church, it's like, eh. This, we have it figured out. My wife comes later, so we just do two different, two different cars. Because, uh, you know, in the morning you're tired, you know, and you haven't had your coffee yet, and it's like, eh. And then everybody comes to church like, hi! Theoretically, that's the way it works. We're in a series uh, conclusion this week. Um, We've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, so if you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew 6, and if you've missed any part of this series, I want to encourage you to go to the app or the website and get caught up, but we've been looking at what does it look like to pray like Jesus, to, and actually, I mean, more important, really, is to answer the question, what would Jesus like to hear? I mean, he is God, and he plays a part in our access to the Father, and and he can tell us, as God the Son, exactly what God wants to hear. And so taking that seriously is, is super important. And so as we review it, remember, uh, oftentimes the Lord's Prayer is, I mean, I, I guarantee you, uh, today's Sunday football, I can't I guarantee you a bunch of different teams are getting in there, they're throwing their hands in like we did in high school, and they're saying, let's say the Lord's Prayer, Right? And, uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like a little formula you say that you're hoping you're going to win. The problem is when both locker rooms are praying the same prayer. And, uh, you know, the bigger problem is just using words like a formula isn't what God has in mind. He wants us to meditate on the word, meditate on what he said here, and get the bigger picture. Not just words you say to get what you want. So we've been walking through in the last few weeks, and let me just review a little bit. Um, we've been using this illustration, um, and the Bible talks about, or in Matthew 6, it starts with, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now what's happened is Jesus has come down to us uh, to reveal the heart of God, to live a perfect sinless life, and to die on the cross. And so Jesus is telling them how to pray with the future in mind. In a sense, when this whole thing is done, when my life is, is, is over on planet earth and I've been crucified and resurrected from the dead, let me tell you what you're going to be able to do. And so he's like, I'm gonna be able to, you're going to be able to come up into the very throne room of God, and it's going to start with, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And, and so what, what does God want you to know? Well, he's your Father if you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He's your Father. And he doesn't use the word our, our Lord of heaven's armies. Because in the Old Testament, that's one of the names he's got, the Lord of heaven's armies. Uh, or just Lord, which deals with curios. It's a, it's a word that means master. He doesn't say, our Lord who art in heaven, although that's implied in this prayer as well. He uses a personal name, like a father. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I've been doing this in my prayer time, and my devotions time, and it's been really helpful. Uh, I've been walking through this process, and, I, and here's what I'm doing at that stage of the game. I'm going, okay, Lord, before I just come in and start talking about my problems and my needs and all this stuff... I got to get this in context. I got to get the world in context. I'm going to start with my father, our father, you're in heaven, and hallowed be your name. That's, that's a worship terminology. In other words, I'm going, to start, I'm going to start with what are all the things that I can be thankful for that you've given me? And I, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about my family that I was born into, my parents siblings, thinking about the wife that God gave me and the person she is and, and, and then the kids that I have and their wives and my grandkids. And I was thinking about the friends that God has given me that care about me and stand beside me but also love me enough to tell me the truth. And I was thinking about 
the workers, co-workers I get to work with, and I get to do something meaningful. And I was just, and it's funny, as when, oftentimes, again, I start in the morning and I wake up and boom, Lord, I got, I got this to do and I got that to do and I need you to do this and I need you, and I'm I, it, just kind of sitting in what he has already done for me, so that when I come and ask him for something, I'm not asking him as if he hasn't answered me a thousand times or been there for me a thousand times. And all the other problems I've had, he heard me, he walked with me, he helped me. He, 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 you understand what I'm saying? And to start with our father, he's my father because of what Jesus did, and what, that's what it cost him. And, and he's a good father. He, yes, he's in charge of the, the whole world, but in that very same passage in Matthew 5 through 7, he talks about that nothing happens outside of the will of the Father. He knows the very numbers of hairs on our head. He is a good father. Which then leads to, as I start to think about planet Earth, it's like, all right, Lord, not my will be done, but yours. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then... And then as I start to think, all right, all right, Lord, today your will, not mine, yours. And I'm going to be obedient to you because you're king and you're a good father and you're right. And everything you ever said is because you love me. Every command you ever gave is for my good. So your kingdom come, your will be done. And then it leads to, okay, Lord, but I have some needs and I'm going to rely on you and I'm going to trust you for them. My daily trust, my trust today, you'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. I get so hung up on tomorrow, I don't think about what he's doing today and I get so all freaked out and anxiety and all that. No, no, no. Trust today, you're going to take care of today. And you know what, Lord, I'm also going to be satisfied with my needs. Because, listen, I could, I could go, it's never enough. No, you're going to take care of my needs and I'm going to be satisfied with that. And, and then as you start to, the next, the next rung, Lord, forgive me, my debt says, I've, I've, I forgive those who trespass against me. Remember, we've talked about this. Everything in the, in the scriptures is about love for God and love for others. If you're going to walk with God, it leads. As I soak in the grace of God, as I soak in the grace of God, I needed it. He's my father, and he died on the cross for me, and I need his grace. That's going to go to me and through me. The only way I can have relationship with other people who are broken, and I myself am broken, is if we live in an environment where we look past each other's faults instead of criticize all the time. We forgive one another when we make mistakes. Hey, the only way broken people can actually be in relationship is if they forgive well. And they seek forgiveness well. So Lord, as you shape me, help me to be a person who receives your grace because you're my father and gives grace because they're your father too. We're a family. That's where we've been so far. And as I've doing my devotions, I've been walking through, what do I have to be thankful for? Lord, what is, the, what is your will for me today? You're, what are the things in my life that I've been neglecting or, or not doing what I should? What are, I'm going to be obedient to you today. Just do it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to do it. And Lord, what are, what are the things that I, I need from you today that are real needs? And if it's not a real need, help me to accept what I've got and not get greedy. And, 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 you know, and, and Lord, who do I need to forgive? And Help me to have a spirit of forgiveness today. And, and so as you're walking out this, there's this last little verse that I think is super important. Uh, go ahead and look at your scriptures there. Look at what this says. It says, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. That's the end of the prayer. Lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil. I'm going to unpack that. But first I want you to notice that here's what Jesus is really saying. As you remember who you are, you are the child of the Most High God. As you seek to do his will, as you seek to be thankful for what you have and trust him, as you seek to be in relationship with other people, while you're trying to walk that in your life, as you hit planet Earth, you are right in the middle of a war. He closes this. He closes this with, as you're trying to do this, you have an enemy who's, who's not going to remind you that, that God's your father. He's going he's to try to tell you that God is the dictator and he doesn't care about you and he's not where he's supposed to be. And he's not, no, as you're down here trying to remember that, the enemy's going to try to keep you away from that. 
Rather than you know who you are and you're not trying to prove it to the whole world by, by doing what they do, he, he wants you, God wants you to know who you are and you're a child and you're valuable and you're important. The enemy's going to tell you you're not valuable enough unless you can do this or you know, he's going to lie to you. And as you, 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 you seek to, no, not my will but yours, the devil's going to go, you can't trust God to do his will. You need to, to not, not listen to him. He's trying to keep you down all the way back to the garden. You want to rule your own life. And, and he's, it, it, you know, whatever your needs are, I mean, that's not enough. You need more. You need more money, more houses, more cars, more f- fame, more acclaim, more, you need more, more, more. And, and, and then as you start to get in your relationships, he's, gonna, he's the great divider. If God is the reconciler of relationship, the devil is a liar and a destroyer, and he, he wants you to be isolated. When you're walking on planet Earth, he wants you to not forgive. He wants you to be too proud to say you're sorry. He's going to fill in the gaps. You've got this spiritual enemy as you're walking this out. God wants you to know there is a war on and to have the right expectations. I know that some of you uh, heard the the Christian sort of message that if you give your life to Jesus and you do everything right, then God's going to take away your problems. And then when he doesn't take away all your problems... You know, then you're mad at him. You're like, well, where are you, God? And, and I can't tell you how many people say they left the faith. You've, you've heard all this deconstruction language? Deconstruction? That What that means is they've decided to rethink Christianity and they're, they're leaving Christianity because it, it why? It, well, it wasn't what it was supposed to be. Well, what did you think it was supposed to be? Well, he was supposed to, uh, where did you hear that? It's not from Scripture. Scripture paints a very different picture, that there's a war on, that the world has fallen. Someday, someday, Jesus is going to return. He's going to get rid of the devil. He's going to change those who want to be changed into have an eternal body with no more sinful nature. He's going to set the world up, and those who are on it are going to be those who want God to be who he is and accept him for who he is. Those who want to be forgiven, those who have repented of their sin, those who have, it, it, that's who's going to be there. Until that time, we got a whole bunch of craziness. And, and what's so funny is, if they would just read the scriptures, they would see that's exactly what the Bible says. The world is a broken place. But so many of them are like, well, there can't be a God because the world's a broken place. The Bible says it's a broken place. If you look around, what the Bible describes is exactly what we see. God, Jesus here is saying, listen, as you're walking with me, you're going to face a battle. The, Bi- the Bible tells us even what the, the devil is like, how he works. John 8, he's a murderer and a liar and a deceiver. So he uses deceit to kill. The Bible says he's a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. He's a schemer, a planner. He masquerades as an angel of light. What does that mean? It means he dresses up in good. He doesn't come out with a pitchfork and horns and all that. That, That's not how he looks at all. He, he He plays as a masquerader. He dresses up as somebody else to deceive you. If the devil showed you his evil, demonic, sort of Hollywood version, everybody would run to God. And how does that serve the purposes of God, or of the devil? If if he scares us to, to God, how does that serve his purposes? He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, the Bible says. There's a battle. It's not going to be easy. Right now, I want you to go with me to that passage again, where there's some, I was writing some things down about this, this one little verse that I thought, were, I thought was important. So let me, let me just tell you what I wrote down when I was thinking about this, uh, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. First, I want you to notice that the person who's praying that prayer has decided that there is evil. Would you agree with that? And 
he's agreeing with God about what evil is. So this is a person who says, deliver me from evil, lead me not in temptation to do evil. Don't, I don't want to be in, in, in a place where, uh, where it would be easy for me to do those things. Guard my steps. He's saying, listen, deliver me from evil. Now here's what that means. It means that the, the, the prayer, the person praying, Jesus in this case, teaching us to do the same, is in agreement with God about the, the fact that there is evil and what evil is. And he doesn't want to do it anymore. See, there's been a change of heart. But I don't know about you, before I was a Christian, I wanted to sin. I, I didn't want to do every sin because I wasn't tempted by every sin. There were other people that were tempted by other sins. I was tempted to my, by my own sins. And I, all I wanted was if it was bad, I just didn't want to have to pay for it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with the consequences. I wanted what I wanted. I wasn't really thinking about how it impacted somebody else. Uh, my sin, I wasn't thinking about the ripple of impact. I was thinking about me and what it meant to me. And, that was, and, and I loved my sin. But when, there, when, when, when I discovered who Jesus was, when he re revealed himself to me and who he was, it changed my heart. I started to see as he saw I saw evil for what it, uh, what it is. It, it, it's truly despicable, and it cost Jesus his life. It wasn't okay because everybody was doing it. The, nobody voted on whether it was okay. There was right and there was wrong. God said it. And the person who's praying this prayer has had a heart change about it. I don't want to do it anymore, and I agree with God that it's wrong. We live in a world, would you agree, that is redefining terms. We got, we got people who don't believe homosexuality is sin. We got people who do believe homosexuality is sin, but they don't think adultery or fornication is sin. So now it's, it's you know, opposite sex is okay. And I know that because we have people who come to church who, who maybe prayed a prayer at one point and maybe, uh, or was baptized. They had an event where they said the right words, sort of a thing. And, and, but then they're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend, knowing full well what God says about sex outside of marriage. And, but that's okay, and I can be a Christian. Why? Well, because everybody's doing it. It's acceptable. No, see, a Christ follower says, your kingdom come, your will be done. A Christ follower says, there is evil, and there's been a heart change about evil. Deliver me. I don't want to do it anymore. Now, this is important. Listen, the Bible tells us repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just say be baptized. There is a change of heart, a repentance that says there is evil and I, I don't want to do it because of what it costs Jesus because he's right and he's good and the Holy Spirit now has moved inside of me and, and there's a change going on in me I'm becoming holy and set apart. Now, there's a change of heart. But then if you go through this verse, there's something else that I think it's important to see. Number one, there's a change of heart, repentance. I don't want to do evil anymore. But secondly, there's also an acceptance of vulnerability that it's possible for me to do evil, even though I don't want to. So he's saying, I don't want to do evil. Deliver me, Lord. Lead me not into temptation. It, it, there's a humility about him now, about those who pray this prayer, that understand the only reason they get to be in the throne room of God is because of what Jesus did for them and their sin. And they, there's a change of heart, but there's also an understanding that they are vulnerable while they're walking down here on planet Earth, they're, 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 they're down here walking and they're battling and they, they, there's an acceptance that, that I have a sin nature. That I have the devil that's at work. I have a culture that's broken. I have a pure culture that says everything's up in the air. Nothing is established except for what you want to be established, Lord. I, can, I, am, I am susceptible and it creates a humility in me. 
rather than a pride. Pride that says, well, I can't sin anymore. I can, I, you know how many, there, there's this, this theology that says that out there that you could actually get to the place where you don't sin on planet earth. You, you, can, you can actually get to the place where you don't sin. Now remember the definition of sin is to do the wrong thing or to do the right thing for the wrong reasons or to not do something that you should do. It's not just what you don't do, it's about what you do. When you outline sin and what it really is, both action and intent, guess what you find out? We're toast. Every one of us is susceptible and we falter, which is why we need God's grace and we need to be reminded he's our father. We all make mistakes, even when we don't mean to. I don't even have to mean to and I can make a mistake. And so can you. Can I get an amen on that? What happens is I understand that I am susceptible. I have the Holy Spirit, but I also have the sin nature. There's battle going on in me, and sometimes I get confused. And so you have this, this humility that comes in you. Rather than judging somebody else for their sin, I, I may not struggle with that exact sin, but I struggle with sin. So I don't have the right to come as a judge. I don't have the right to, to say your, uh, your addiction to whatever, uh, alcohol or whatever, it, it, that's worse than my addiction to food or whatever. I, I'm not saying that, one, that either of them are right. I'm not using it as an excuse to say go ahead, but I'm, I'm coming in humility knowing that I needed Jesus to die for me and I still need his grace constantly. So when I come, it's not out of pride or arrogance. It's out of a brother who has been there, susceptible to it. I understand. I mean, I don't, again, it's whatever sin we don't put, struggle with, it's usually the one we think's the worst. Right? That's how we do comparison. You know, well, I don't struggle with that sin, and I can always find somebody who struggles with the sin I don't struggle with, which is, automatically means it's the worst one, and that's the worst one. No. There's a humility in this prayer that leads to, forgive me as I, I forgive those who trespass against me. Humility. Now, again, we know that Jesus is teaching us to pray, and that's not something Jesus ever would have to pray because he didn't trespass against anybody. But he's here in this story, this teaching, teaching us to, that we'll need to be forgiven, and we're going to have to forgive other people's debts. And, 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 and the enemy is going to work against us. And so as I go out into the world, I'm going to have to be alert and awake to the fact that there's a battle. I'm going to have to, to, to step back and go, wait a minute, my heart has changed, but I'm still susceptible. So God, help me. And then thirdly, here, there's this, uh, this reliance upon God. God, I'm going to need your help. God isn't sending us anywhere to do anything. He's inviting us to go with him by the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it, we now have the indwelling presence, and we together are going to go into this world. We're going to do battle, and I'm going to have to be dependent upon God to protect me. And, and, and if I decide to get too far ahead of him, and by the way, that's why God says, give me today my daily bread. Give me, get, today I want to do your will. Because listen, if he told us a week's worth of his will, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even think to go back to him until a week later to get the new lessons or the new instructions. He doesn't want us to go without him anywhere he wants us to go with him and he invites us so we're going to do this together day by day trusting me that's what he's saying and so what do you have here you have this this dependence upon God God I need you to protect me I'm going to walk with you now 
when you read this passage, what it can sound like and what somebody might say is, well, okay, why has Jesus said, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil? I mean, is Jesus leading me into temptation? No, I'm going to give you a couple of passages to go uh, and do some study on, and we'll, we'll read some of them right now. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 12, James chapter 1, verse 12. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. These are the two passages, and they kind of fit together. But it kind of explains what Jesus is talking about here in the Lord's Prayer. First, this is James chapter 1, verse 12. Listen to this. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, he, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, what kind of trial? When tempted... Did he say if tempted or when tempted? When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. Now stop right there. That word tempt and that word trial are the same word. God's going to take us out into the world and, and because we're fighting against an enemy, it's going to be a trial. That trial may just be some sort of sickness and then the temptation will be don't trust God because he's not healing you. Or the, or the temptation may be um, a loss of job. There are times where the world's a crazy place and that could happen. The trial will be God's gonna allow you to go through that, why? So that you can build character, so that you can learn to trust God. But the temptation is the enemy's part and the temptation, he's gonna come and say, you know what? Uh, you, the temptation is to say, you know what, God, I'm not trusting you anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, do what it takes to get this job. I'm, rather than doing it your way, I'm going to step on who I need to step on. I'm going to climb the corporate ladder. I'm going to rely on me. So there's a trial that God may uh, uh, allow us to go through. But then the enemy is the, is the opponent here, and he has a completely different objective. See, he's trying to use the trial to tempt you to quit. God's allowing the trial to teach you to grow. And so as you look through this, you see, uh, let me give you an example. I've had kids on my wrestling team in the past who were, um, were not uh, great kids, didn't want to do the right thing, and I would uh, uh, have some kids that were great kids, and I would put together a practice that was meant to be a trial. Difficult, build character. But now, one of these kids who's in the midst of this trial, who doesn't understand my heart, doesn't care about this, doesn't want to do what he's told, he's whispering in the ear of the kid going, hey, the coach isn't looking, let's, let's mess around. You know what, hey, let's go to the bathroom, just stay there for a, we, we got, you know, he's whispering and he's tempting and tempting. Now, he's taking a trial that I'm putting together for a different reason and he's tempting the kid to do the wrong thing in the midst of the trial. Does that make sense to you? It's exactly how the enemy works. Now, as you start to unpack this, let's read it. He says, uh, he says um, uh, 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 blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Notice there's the internal part. You have your own sinful desires. They start small, you feed them, they get bigger, they get more strong or stronger. Then here comes the enemy to entice. So you have the internal, you have the external enticement. Then he goes on and he says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So it starts with the desire, you give into it, and now it becomes an action. That action becomes a habit and it ends in killing your soul, your relationships, but it starts with this combination of you have an internal desire that's broken. Here comes the enemy. Here's how you can satisfy that desire. And he entices. 
but don't say God is tempting. So when you read that verse, uh, lead us not into temptation, he's, he, he's not, uh, as you look at the whole scope of scripture, he's saying, listen, you're going to be going through a trial. The enemy is going to try to use it as an opportunity to tempt you. And he's even going to lie to you. One of the things I've heard people say a lot is things like this. I, I mean, I, it sounds crazy, but I, I hear it. You know, uh, my marriage is really hard, and I've been praying. Do I get in or out of this marriage? I mean, is it, is it really worth it? And I'm praying to God, and the next thing I know, a coworker asked me out for a drink. And I went, well, okay, I've been praying about it. That must be God's answer. What? God's word already said that if you're married, God stood as a witness for the rest of your life and adultery being with somebody else's sin. Well, but I prayed about it, and then there's this opportunity. Don't give credit to God for that. The enemy can be at play here too, and you just fell for it. Don't say God is tempting you to sin. You may be in a trial in which you need to press into him and dive back into your marriage as God's word has already said. The spirit of God does not contradict the word of God. You need to dive back in, but the enemy is working and then you give, you say, God did that? Well, Jim, I mean, I, I'm not happy. I mean, aren't I supposed to be happy? Love just shouldn't be this hard. What? <laughs> Biblical love is an act of the will to die to yourself and lay down your life for the need of someone else. When was that ever easy? That's never been easy in my life. Maybe you have an easy time at it. But I don't ever have an easy time at that. Love is to choose the good of someone else above yourself and that is completely contrary to my sinful nature. Well, he says, don't, don't say the devil or, or the Lord tempted you. He doesn't tempt you to do evil. He doesn't, eat, he doesn't do evil. You trust God and do what he said. Here's, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. This, this fits together with this, verse 11. Look at this. He's speaking about the Old Testament uh, scriptures here, and he's saying, hey, listen, all that stuff written down in the Old Testament was, was for uh, teaching you, warning you. I was, my wife and I were doing our coffee time, and she's been reading the Old Testament again, and she's like, Jim, I'm just telling you, those people are jacked up in the Old Testament. And, 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 and you know, I was like, yeah, it's, that stuff's not in there because God approves of it. It's stu that stuff's in there because, because people really did it. And the only hero of the story is God using broken people. That's, just because that guy had three wives doesn't mean you're supposed to have three wives. God said have one, he had three, and the story didn't turn out so well. It's there for your warning. Well, here's what he says. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, now notice this. If, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So what's he saying? That uh, First of all, one of the things that the enemy will tell you is, you know, no one could handle the temptation in this trial you're going through. You know when somebody tells me that? I'll, I'll always think in my mind, and if it's the right time, I'll say it to them, you, you must be going to church instead of being the church. What do you mean? Because if you were being the church, meaning confessing your sins one to another, you were part of relationships where people got real, you would find out that you're not the only one struggling with that, whatever that is. Every Christian is struggling with one form of temptation or another. Everyone. All of us are battling. And so when you actually open up, you find out, oh, oh, okay, I'm not the only one. Because what the devil will do is, if you are sinning, he'll drive you into the ground saying, you're no good, you're a zero, you can't get up until you get your life. And then you'll find out, wait a minute, no, I'm not the only one, other people are struggling too, so I don't have to have such shame. Or he'll tell you, you've got it so bad, 
You have got it so bad that you, you might as well just give in to it. It's, it, it God isn't going to care. It, it's all right if you, if you do that. And, and what you'll find out is, you know what? There's a bunch of people who are not giving in. There are a bunch of people that are having the same temptations, and you start to go, okay. So he's saying, there's no temptation that has overcome you that is not common to man. Now, we don't have all the exact same one. I don't have uh, same-sex attraction. I don't have that. I have heterosexual attraction. There isn't one or the other that's worse. They're both, if, they're, if I give in to whichever one of those are, it leads to sin. I, I, I mean, if I, if I choose to go beyond what God has provided in Scripture, I'm sinning. There's no temptation to overcome you that's not common to man. And it, it, we all have to say, no, not my will be done, but yours. Yours, Lord. You're right, no matter what the world says. And so as you walk down this passage, notice what he says next. I love this. He says very clearly, he says, uh, so if you think you're standing firm, you don't get proud. Be careful that you don't fall. I, I, when I think about being careful, I think about uh, walking through a minefield. Could you imagine walking through a minefield like in Afghanistan or wherever where the mines have been set all over? And you, and you know they're there, but you can't see them. So how do you go, how do you do this? Carefully. Carefully walk. What would be the opposite of being careful? Careless. What is it like to walk carelessly in the midst of a minefield? Here's what the scripture is saying. Be careful. Don't think you're above falling. You can be vulnerable. Be careful how you walk. He goes on. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation is overcoming you except what is common to man. And God will, will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able. So, so what does that mean? He'll provide a way of escape out. What does that mean? It means you're going to be tempted, but you have a choice. Well, the fact that I gave in means that I was being tempted beyond that which was I, I was able. No, it doesn't. It means you blew right through the barriers. You blew right through them. And now, if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you're, you're convicted. Now, what the devil will do is he will shame you, rub you in the dirt. You can't get up. If it's the Holy Spirit, then you'll be convicted, and the, the, it will be this. Hey, that's not who you are. Come on, my friend. That was paid for. Let's get up. Let's put that away. That's hurting you. That's hurting others. Let's not, you're done with that. Come on into the throne room of God. You're, you're, you're a kid. You're his kid. I love you. But the devil's like, you're no good. It's too late for you. You're no good for anybody else. You can't go into, into the throne room of God until you get your life together. How do you do that? How do you get your life together so much that you can walk into the throne room of God? Well, you can't. You go into the throne room of God because you're covered by the blood of Jesus. Now, there's one last thing I want to point out to you here. Do you remember uh, how I was talking about when you go into the throne room? By the way, I'm, I'm trying to incorporate, it's like stairs and steps into my, for weight loss purposes. So, <laughs> our father, not my, my father alone. Yes, he's my father, but he's our father. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Notice he's moving me from me to we. Not my father alone, but our father, family of God. Not my needs alone, our needs. Give us. Sometimes I have enough that I can share with you. Sometimes you'll have enough you can share with others. We start to care about each other. It's not a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Everybody's out there on their own. We actually care about others. It's changing us. Right? Right? Forgive me as I forgive those who trespass against me. It's now it's building relationship with others. And then don't miss this part. 
lead uh, or deliver me from evil, lead us, deliver us. There's this we and us part at the end. Look at that verse again. Lead me not into temptation. There's the personal part, but deliver us from evil. Here, what, what's this us stuff? Well, there's a piece of this, guys, that God expected for the family of God, the army of God, to work together to defeat the enemy of God. See, I'm so grateful for the guys in my life who have looked me in the eye when things were small and said, what's going on before they got too big? Who told me the truth, who I could confess my sins to and my struggles, and they confessed theirs to me so I didn't feel alone in all this. I'm so grateful to have people who who didn't just see it was me and Jesus and you're on your own. No, it was me and Jesus and it's we and Jesus and we're protecting each other. We're guarding one another. We're fighting for one another. So let me ask you, as we get ready to go into this next season in our small groups and and all that, are, are you protected? Are you walking in the protection that God provides? Have you surrounded yourself with believers that will protect you from you? But it's not just about you. Did you know that that there may be a week where the, you being at church really wasn't to, to, to wow you in some way, but it was God bringing you there to minister to somebody else who needed the help that a brother or sister could provide. We were supposed to do this together. Deliver us from you. I'm going to close. Just We're going to say the prayer together. If you'd like to say it with me, I'd love it. It'll be on the screen. But as, even if your eyes are open and reading, I'm hoping you're internalizing this. It says this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.